1775 to the 96th district and with a large force defeated the loyalists. Descendants of the general and his two wives are in Clarington County all over South Carolina and the USA. I expect there are some of his descendants here tonight. Some DAR chapters are named for Richardson relatives. A local relative wrote down the family's waltz music about 15 years ago, and the Richardson waltz shortly thereafter became the South Carolina State Waltz. Ma'am, step back in time to September of the year 1790. You've all been invited to attend the dedication of a monument to the memory of General Richard Richardson at the Richardson Graveyard in our Clarendon County. Mrs. Dorothy Sinclair Richardson is about to speak. Ladies and gentlemen, we have gathered hither this day to commemorate the 10th anniversary of the death of my husband, General Richard Richardson, and to honor his memory by placing this marble monument here to mark the place where his body rests. There are many amongst you who were well acquainted with my husband and others who knew him by reputation. He was many things, a tender and affectionate husband, a fond father who set his sons a great and good example, a true and loyal friend, a good neighbor. He was a leader here in the county and an outstanding militia commander, but he was also a trained surveyor, a prosperous planter, and as you gentlemen all know, especially those amongst you who are somewhat addicted to horse racing, he was a fine breeder of thoroughbred horses. Indeed, he was the best and worthiest of men, and his family and friends still mourn his loss. General Richardson was not born here in South Carolina, as many of us were, but rather in Jamestown, in Virginia, in the year 1704. He did not venture south until he was six and 20 years of age. A young man, educated, trained as a surveyor. He was drawn hither to South Carolina, as so many others were in those days, by the promise of land. He settled here in the area north of the Santee, married his first wife, and in 1744 petitioned for his first grant of land. And though he went on to acquire more land later in his life, it was that first grant, all the land between Halfway Slump and Jack's Creek, that he made his manor plantation. He called it Big Home. I still live there with my sons. My husband was a man of high character, a person who inspired confidence in all who were acquainted with him. It is not surprising then that his neighbors elected him to represent them in the Commons House of the General Assembly. And it was not long before he rose in the ranks of the militia. I believe it were in 1757 that he became colonel. I, it were 57 for it was just before the war with the Cherokee, in which, I might add, he fought with great courage. Ladies and gentlemen, little did any of us know then that our men would be called upon 
to use the lessons they learned in those wars to fight another and greater war, the war for American independency. The troubles between the colonies and the mother country had begun just before I become the second Mrs. Richardson. That was in 1768, one year after the death of Mrs. Mary Richardson, the general's first wife. I was 30 years of age, living with my brother on his plantation, when Mr. Richardson made me an offer of marriage. And ladies, I am certain that you would all agree Mr. Richardson was a man quite capable of capturing the esteem of any woman acquainted with him, and I lost not a moment's hesitation in accepting his most obliging offer. And in the 12 years that we was married, I was pleased to present him with four sons. It is my oldest son, Mr. James Richardson, who is erecting this monument in his father's memory. He would have spoke to you on this occasion but he is suffering from an inflammation of the throat. He can scarce speak above a whisper. That task then has fallen to me. As I said, the disagreements between the colonies and Great Britain began just before Mr. Richardson and I was wed. He was a strong supporter of colonial protests against British policies from the very beginning. He was a member of the legislature in 1769 and voted to pass the non-importation agreement. You recall, it was a protest against the towns and duties. And then he was a member of that new legislature, the Provincial Congress, that was meeting in Charleston in the spring <coughs> of 75. When the news of the fighting at Lexington and Concord reached us, and he strongly supported the members of Congress who called for the formation of an association of all the citizens in the colony so that South Carolinians could resist British force with force of their own. A paper called the Association explaining its purpose was, was drawn up for people to sign. The Association called upon all the citizens of South Carolina to be ready to sacrifice their lives and fortunes to secure the safety and freedom of the colony until, that is, a reconciliation could be reached between Great Britain and America. Anyone who refused to sign the association was to be considered an enemy to the liberty of the colonies. Mr. Drayton, uh, Mr. William Henry Drayton, was to take the association into the interior parts of the colony to gain the support of the people there. He was to explain to them in great detail the causes of the present disputes between Great Britain and America and to persuade the people to sign the association. And that was the most difficult task for him to accomplish. For I fear that gentlemen from Charleston were not held in high regard by people living in the interior parts of the colony. It was said there that no man from Charleston can speak the truth and that all papers are full of lies. It seemed advisable then that some gentlemen who were not from Charleston and who would be seen as more trustworthy should accompany Mr. Drayton on his journey. And since my husband had already made his support for the association known, and he was deemed to be a man of honor. He was asked to be one of the party accompanying Mr. Drayton. My husband left in the early part of August. He returned in a few weeks' time, and he had no good news to relate. Many people had refused to sign the association, and Tory leaders in the western part of the colony were attracting large numbers of supporters. He had returned home, he told me, to muster the militia in case they was needed. And indeed, in the fall, they were needed. For in November, a band of men, calling themselves the King's Men, captured several supply wagons loaded with guns and ammunition belonging to the Patriots. Then 2,000 of them 
marched on the town of 96, occupied the courthouse and the jail, surrounded the stockade being held by the Patriots under Major Williamson. General uh, Colonel Richardson, as he was then, had already mustered the militia in the Camden district, and he was ordered by Congress to go to the west and put down the uprising. By the time he and his men reached 96, a truce had been called. A treaty had been drawn up and signed by both sides. Under the terms of the treaty, the men from both sides were to be allowed to return home unmolested. Major Williamson had signed the treaty, but my husband and Colonel Thompson the other militia commander in the area had not signed it. And they both agreed that since they had not signed the treaty, they was under no obligation to abide by it. Colonel Richardson issued a proclamation demanding that the king's men return the captured wagons and that they and their followers surrender their own arms and ammunition within five days' time. He then marched through the countryside, leaving little resistance, he said, for most of the people came willingly in to surrender their arms. I recall that he also told me that he and Colonel Thompson had decided to adopt a policy of firmness, tempered with forbearance and leniency, which he believed had had a good effect. Had I burned and plundered and laid waste and destroyed, seizing on private property, he told me, then thousands of women and children would have been left to perish, a thought shocking to humanity. And indeed, many would have perished, for it was December and the snow lay deep upon the ground and it was bitterly cold. I was pleased when Colonel Richardson returned home in January of 76. I was carrying our fourth child at the time, little Thomas, and I was pleased to have my husband at home, even though it were but for a short time. For in March, he was called to Charleston on government business. He was a member of the Second Provincial Congress, and as such, he helped to draft and approve the new interim constitution for South Carolina. Under the terms of the new constitution, the Provincial Congress became the General Assembly. They promptly met to elect leaders for the new government. How pleased and proud we all were to learn that Colonel Richardson had been elected to the Legislative Council. But he was soon called from his government duties to take up his military duties in June, uh, when the British attacked Charleston. He was the commander of the Camden District Militia, and a detachment of his militia helped to defeat the British fleet at the Battle of Sullivan's Island. And then you will recall, ladies and gentlemen, the British left, and we had nearly two years of relative peace all the fighting was taking place in the north. But we knew the British would return. And when they did, my husband was called away once again to take up his military duties. He was promoted to Brigadier General in March 78 and commanded the 2nd Battalion of South Carolina Militia at Perrysburg in December 78. And he and his <coughs> militia were in Charleston in the spring of 1780, helping to defend the town when the British laid siege to it. And then in May, Charleston surrendered. Will any of us ever forget the shock of that news? General Richardson, like the rest of the militia, was allowed to give his parole and return home. But to my great distress, he was not allowed to remain there for long. The British occupied Georgetown in July, and Major Weems, the British commander, gave it as his opinion that 10 or 12 of the Patriot leaders should be paroled and sent to the Sea Islands south of Charleston. He was afraid that if the rebel leaders remained in the area, they would 
be a danger to the new loyalist government. They would be a deterrent to the formation of a loyalist militia. He had the most dangerous of the men sent to the Sea Islands. The ones deemed less dangerous were paroled to their plantations. General Richardson was deemed to be dangerous and sent to John's Island. I was distraught. My husband was six and 70 years of age and not in good health. I thought it was both cruel and quite unnecessary to send him away. Finally, the British realized that his health was indeed failing and he was allowed to return home. He died here in the midst of his family 10 years ago this day. We thought that surely we would be allowed to mourn his passing in peace, but it was not to be so. The British thought that by removing patriot leaders, they were making the area safe for themselves. They could not have been more mistaken. Not all the patriot leaders had been in Charleston for the surrender. General Francis Marion had not been there. And now he was leading a brigade of partisan fighters and they were making life most difficult for the British. In November, Colonel Bannister Tarleton and the British Legion were sent hither to stop General Marion. Having received word that a band of men, presumably General Marion and members of his brigade, were encamped at nearby Jack's Creek, Colonel Tarleton brought his men here to Big Home. It was the 7th of November. I shall never forget the date. The children and I watched as the British soldiers proceeded to conceal themselves and two small artillery pieces they had with them all about our property. Colonel Tarleton then spread the word that most of the soldiers of the British Legion had returned to Camden. He sent his men out in small patrols to make it look as though his reduced force was scattered about the countryside. In an attempt to lure General Marion into an ambush, Colonel Tarleton had his men set up decoy campsites at Big Home. With campfires left burning, provisions cooking over them, while the army lay hidden, waiting. I was greatly afraid that General Marion would ride into the trap that had been set for him. In the early part of the summer, General Marion had sent word to the women whose men were still fighting or who were prisoners of war. He told us to stay at home, make provisions, keep up communications, and send information to the men at camp. I determined to do just that. I had with me at that time my four sons, aged 10, 8, 6, and 4, and my stepson, Major Richard Richardson of the Continental Army. He had been a prisoner of war in Charleston, but he had recently been exchanged in October, and he was hiding on the plantation. I sent him to warn General Marion that he was riding into a trap. Fortunately, Major Richardson ran into General Marion and his men on the road two miles from Big Home. When they heard the news, the men immediately turned about and rode straight to Ridgegrove's Mill, six miles distant, where they encamped for the night. There were Tory prisoners in the Patriot camp that evening, and during the night, one of them managed to escape. By dawn, he was here, reporting to Colonel Tarleton that the partisan fighters would have ridden into the ambush had not General Marion received information from a Richardson. Colonel Tarleton and his men immediately mounted their horses and rode straight for Richburg's mill. But the Patriots were not there. Realizing that one of his prisoners had escaped during the night, <coughs> 
General Marion had been expecting Colonel Tarleton to do just that. He had had his men in the saddle before daybreak. And then, as I understand it, General Marion then led Colonel Tarleton on a merry chase over a twisted route, crisscrossing the countryside, much of it through trackless swamps. Finally, after seven hours of unsuccessful pursuit, Colonel Tarleton decided to call a halt and end his attempt to capture General Marion. Referring to the general as that old fox, Colonel Tarleton reportedly said a devil himself could not catch him. That story soon spread through the countryside, and it was not long before people all up and down the Santee were referring to General Marion as the Swamp Fox. Now, we had been most grateful and relieved when Colonel Tarleton and his men left Big Home. But our relief was short-lived, for they did return. And Colonel Tarleton was not best pleased to have had his opportunity to capture General Marion spoiled because of a Richardson. And he decided to punish us all. He allowed his men to rampage through the house, plundering and looting as they went. He ordered the children and me outside, marched us up here to the graveyard, to the place where General Richardson had been buried but six weeks before. To my horror and shock, I heard him order his men to exhume the governor, the general's body. The children and I watched in horror as the casket was open and we was forced to look on the remains of a beloved father and husband. Colonel Charleston explained that he wanted the body exhumed because he wanted to look on the face of a man of high character, a man of whom everyone spoke so highly. It is to be sure, is it not, that he would never see such a face reflected in his own mirror. But it was not so. They was looking for the family silver, having plundered the house and not found any, and thinking that a man of the general's standing was sure to have some silver plate about. They decided that we had hid it in the general's coffin, but they were sadly mistaken, for it was not there. After forcing my household slaves to fix him dinner, Colonel Tarleton ordered his men to round up the animals on the plantation, the cattle, the swine, the poultry, and herd them all into the barn where the grain from our harvest was stored. They then set fire to it, along with the house and all the outbuildings. I watched with tears in my eyes as everything we owned went up in flames that night, I would rather have been flogged than to have had the barn, the crops, the animals, the house burned. It was November. The nights are cold that time of year. We was forced to huddle around a small fire in the open air. No blankets, no food, no shelter, no means of transport. The memory of that night will remain with me till my dying day. As I tried to comfort my sons that night, I could not help but remember my husband's words when he returned from putting down the Loyalist uprising in the West, that he and Colonel Thompson had adopted a policy of firmness, tempered with forbearance and leniency, which he thought had had a good effect that he would not burn, plunder, destroy, lay waste, and seize on private property, for that would leave women and children to suffer and perish. And I was grateful that no Tory woman or child ever suffered such treatment from an army commanded by my husband. But we were not the only ones to suffer. Many of you did also, and I know you have not forgot it from upon the past. Let us repair.